Hi, hi everyone. How, how is everyone? You having a good evening? Yeah? Yeah? How are you? You good? How are you? You're really good. I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to spend the next 15 minutes going around individually asking each one of you how you're feeling. But I just, I kind of been thinking a lot about the question, how are you? Um, it's quite an innocuous question, isn't it? We ask it sort of every day, dozens of times a day. Um, and it's, it's really a rhetorical question, isn't it? We don't, we don't actually really want to know how people are. Um, it's, it's a politeness. It's like, how are you? Now let's get on to like, you know, the, the kind of important stuff. So we want to hear, I'm fine, I'm good, I'm great. Um, but if I'd said to you, how are you? And you had said to me, I'm really fucking miserable actually. I barely could get out of bed this morning. Um, I've got no energy, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing here. I'm, I'm, I'm just having a terrible time. That wouldn't, that, where would we be, do you know what I mean? So it's good that we don't, I guess, in some respect, ask, <sighs> Uh, answer truthfully, how are you? Um, because, you know, otherwise we'd, uh, we'd, we'd be here all day. Um, that still hasn't gone down. I, it's like playing a gigantic game of boggle. I'm just putting it down here. Um, so anyway, I thought, not that anyone's asked me this question, I thought I'd tell you how I am right now. Um, and I'm not going to lie to you, it's not good. It's not good. I'm really fucking nervous, actually. I'm kind of bricking it. I've never done a talk to a room of intellectual, creative, beautiful people like you. Um, I, like, I'm shaking. Can you see? I'm actually shaking. Um, uh, my heart rate is clearly over 100 beats per minute. I'm probably going to die of a heart attack on stage. <laughs> I'm, wearing, I'm wearing a really hot jumper. <laughs> and it's, it's really cheap and quite itchy. And also, these boots are really uncomfortable. I'm like, don't fall over in the next 10 to 15 minutes. There's also, there's like a slight, like, sweat, cold sweat breaking up <laughs> on my top lip. And, um, and I'm hoping you can't all see it. Um, and I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm right now on a normal Tuesday night. I would be ordering Deliveroo. I'd be, like, lining up cold feet on Sky Plus. Um, so I'm basically feeling like a bit of a fraud. Um, and I've spent the last few weeks kind of thinking, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to talk about? Um, and, of course, at about 3 o'clock today, my brain said, just do what you do best, which is talk about yourself. <laughs> so um, on that note, um, my name is Bryony. I'm 36. Uh, I'm a journalist for the Daily Telegraph, but I'm not a Tory. I'm actually a member of the Labour Party, just so you know. Um, I, don't take that on me either. Um, I live in South London with my three-year-old daughter and my husband, who is also a journalist. He's like a financial journalist. It's very boring. I, thanks for the laughs. Um, <laughs> I grew up on the mean streets of Chiswick. Yeah. Uh, I lived in a terraced house with my mum and my dad. My dad's over there. Um, my younger sister and my brother. We had a Volvo. And, and we went on holiday to places like Cornwall. Please, please, don't, like, I, please don't fall asleep. There's some better stuff to come. Um, I had some cats called Moppet and Mittens. And um, from a young age, I've suffered from an illness that sometimes makes me think I'm a serial-killing paedophile. So you, you see why I was nervous now, right? Um, so I have something called Pure O, which is a um, little known but very common form of obsessive compulsive disorder. <clears throat> now we all, it's a form that makes you think you could be a serial killing paedophile, so that's why it's not talked about very often. Um, you don't go to a dinner party and say, hey guys, I've got this intrusive thought that I might accidentally stab the, put the kitchen knife through your heart. No, it just doesn't work. Um, now, everyone's heard of OCD, right? Yep. Yeah. Right. You may even have described yourself as being a little bit OCD, right? Uh, you've probably, um, you know, heard someone describing themselves as a bit OCD because they're a clean freak or they're a bit ordered, you know, they like things a certain way. Um, or, or what I find, people always say, I'm a bit OCD, you should see my sock drawer. I'm like, you should, it's always the sock drawer. I'm like, you should see my sock drawer. I don't have a sock drawer. <laughs> I just have a floor drobe. It's just things on the floor. I, my husband always says, why don't you have the good OCD? And I'm like, there is no good OCD. 
Um, you know, but also sometimes people use it as a, as, it's a way to describe people positively. They're a perfectionist, they're a high achiever. Um, and sometimes when I've dared to tell someone I have OCD, they've said, oh, that's good, you get stuff done, right? And I'm like, no, it's not, it's just really not good. It's not fun, it's not great. Um, you know, no form of OCD is good. No one would willingly ask for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, the key word of it is disorder. So you may be a bit clean and you may like things a certain way. <laughs> you may have an exemplary, beautiful sock drawer and for which I applaud you. But if these things aren't affecting you in a negative way, then you don't have obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm sorry I'm reading from notes unlike everyone else, I'm just so nervous. Um, so um, let me explain to you the basics of OCD. Concentrate, it's the science bit. Um, sufferers have, have intrusive thoughts, which are obsessions, that they try to calm with certain rituals, which are the compulsions. Um, those compulsions could be anything from repeatedly washing your hands to ruminating a certain number of times about something in your head, or sometimes I would say phrases again and again and again. So I always have in my head, it's like a sort of really bad broken record, like a really terrible Dido album in my head is, is I'd rather I died than my family did. I'd rather I died than my family did. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. And you know, like if, if saying I'd rather I died than my family did actually kept someone alive, there'd be no need for hospitals or science or anything like that. But there is no logic to OCD, no rhyme or reason. It's just kind of bonkers. Um, so some people that have OCD, they fear being contaminated. So that's the hand washing stuff that we all know about. Um, others fear harm coming to the people they love. Um, some people become anxious that they might be child molesters uh, because of inappropriate thoughts that might pop into their heads when surrounded by young people. Not inappropriate, intrusive thoughts. Um, Everyone has these thoughts, but almost everyone dismisses them because they realize they're just part of the brain's randomness, right? We have millions of thoughts every day, and if we took, paid attention to each and every one of them, we would all go completely mad. And we've all thought, what if I drop this baby when the baby's handed to us, right? What if it just go boom and throw it out the window? You know, we've all thought that. Or we've all stood on the train platform, haven't we, the tube platform, and gone, what if I just pushed that bloke, that dude, under the oncoming central line? Right, we have all thought this, right? But we don't, yes, but we don't actually think we're going to act on it, right? We realise that, you know, these are just random thoughts, we're not going to do them. But the same cannot be said for the person who's a little bit OCD. Uh, they cling to these thoughts, they fret about them obsessively, funnily enough. They become incredibly distressed by them. But let me tell you, someone with OCD is probably the least likely person in the world to actually become a serial killer or a paedophile. Um, because they find it so, you know, distressing. Um, but then, as I said, logic and reason doesn't work with someone with obsessive compulsive disorder. So I like to describe it as being an illness whereby it's basically your brain refuses to acknowledge what your eye can see. So your eye can see that the oven isn't on. Your eye can see that your hands are perfectly clean. Your eye can see that the door is closed. Your eye can see that you haven't just molested a child. Your eyes can see that the, you haven't just murdered someone by running over them. It's just a speed bump but your brain refuses to acknowledge it. It's like being caught, trapped in your own head constantly. Um, and OCD is often called the doubting disease. Uh, there's a lot of what ifs. And often one of the best bits of OCD I found, one of the most meta bits is you think, what if I don't actually have OCD? What if I am using this as a way to excuse myself for all the heinous criminal activities I have taken part in and blanked out from my memory, right? It's, it's just a fucker, it's, you don't want, OCD is not good. So here I thought, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what being OC, a bit OCD means to me. So, and I I'm apologize in advance if some of this is a bit difficult to say because it is difficult to say, but you need to say it because people need to know, <laughs> we need to break down the stigma of mental illness. So 
Being a little bit OCD means that when you were 12 years old and the most that you should be worrying about is whether you're going to make the netball A team or which member of Take That you're going to marry. It was Robbie. It was always Robbie. Um, you will wake up one morning convinced that you were dying of AIDS. Yeah, no matter that you have uh, never kissed a boy and that your drug habit is at least 10 years off and even then it doesn't get intravenous. That's it, it's over. You know, it's AIDS or even Ebola. I actually thought that I had Ebola. And, and you know, this was, this was like an outbreak in Papua New Guinea decades ago. Um, uh, anyway, what it means to be a bit OCD is you're too scared to hold your mother's hand or any of your family for that matter. What it means is you um, hide your toothbrush under your pillow because you don't want to infect your family and condemn them to death as well. It means you can't leave the house because you're too scared of the horrors that might lurk outside. Being a little bit OCD means that every time you pass a child on the street, awful intrusive thoughts of them naked stalk through your head. Being a little bit OCD means that when you're about to do your A-levels and life should be full of hope, you will start to wonder if you might be capable of killing someone. If you could pour bleach in your little brother's cup or grind up paracetamol into your parents' food. Sorry, Dad. If you might have to th have throttled someone on your way home from school and then blanked it all out in shock. Being a little bit OCD means that you start to offer prayers to the universe to keep your family alive. It has actually worked so far, so... Um, being a little bit OCD means that you will spend your 20s in a spiral of tawdry self-medication in an effort to kind of stop yourself from feeling alcohol, cocaine, so, so much cocaine. And can I just tell you, cocaine is not a good drug to take if you're mentally ill. Just, it feels like a good idea at the time, it's just never a good idea. Uh, terrible relationships with terrible people, not least myself. Um, eating disorders, sex with strangers, general self-loathing. Um, being a little bit OCD means that when finally something really awesome happens to you, your brain will work its hardest to screw this up. It means that when you fall in love and are expecting a baby, suddenly someone actually impregnated me, guys, uh, you will worry that the baby might not belong to your beloved. <laughs> this was the worst, that she is the product of a liaison you have once again blanked out. Um, never mind that none of the previous catastrophes you created in your head proved to be true. This one could, right? So being a little bit OCD means that what you then do when you're six months pregnant, you go to Barbados with your fiancé on a baby moon, and you spend, you're so far gone in anxiety that you spend the whole of the baby moon asking your fiancé if he's actually the father of your child. He was. He is. Um, <laughs> uh, being a little bit OCD means that 18 months after your daughter is born, your gorgeous, precious, wonderful daughter, you will start to worry that you have abused her in your sleep or after too many glasses of wine on a night out, that you were a paedophile, that you were pure evil, that you might pour poison in her milk bottle, that old chestnut, or that something terrible might happen to her if you don't chant a certain phrase again and again and again. I'd rather I died than she did. Um, being a little bit OCD means that you worry constantly that she's going to be taken away from you. I don't need the script for this. That the police are coming to get her, you. Um, and it means that you start to think of ways to end it. Because why would you carry on living without your daughter? And this is the point at which you say, I've had enough, actually, OCD, fuck you, right? My therapist, who I, after 22 years of suffering from OCD without seeking any help, said to me, give, give your OCD a name, because it really helps. And I called my OCD Jareth the Goblin King. And I don't, I don't know if any of you have seen Labyrinth. I hope you have, guys. You're, like, clearly clever, not Philistines. Labyrinth, uh, Jareth the Goblin King was played by David Bowie. Um, and he wore, wore sort of tight silver legging trousers. And he was evil, but ever so slightly enticing. Uh, and... When I'm having a bad OCD day, I will say, fuck off, Jareth, and cab drivers will sort of go, what, what? Um, anyway, 
So I said, enough, Jareth, enough. I've given you all this power over me by not talking about you, by having no words for you. And when you have no words for something, you can be sure that that thing has got its claws into you. So every time someone asked me how I was and said something was wrong, I lied. But not this time. This time, a poor colleague who I sat next to at work, poor Joe, I still feel sorry for him, he said, are you all right? And I was sitting at my desk, I was fighting back tears, and I was desperate to just leave the office, get to nursery, pick my daughter up, just be with her before whoever it was was going to come and take her away from me. And he said, how are you? And I burst into tears, so that answered him that question. Um, I said, I'm not okay, actually. And then I did um, the only thing I could, and it's something I should have done years and years ago, pardon me, given that I'm a what one calls a confessional journalist. And I wrote about my pure O, um, which is something I hadn't. I'd managed to write a book called The Wrong Knickers, uh, as, uh, as, as you explained earlier, in which I wrote about men snorting cocaine off my breasts. I wrote about picking someone up in an STI clinic. I wrote about um, having an affair and being made to have sex in front of Newsnight, the dulcet tones of Jeremy Paxman. And I'd written all of these things, but I'd never been able to talk about the backdrop to all of this, which was a kind of history of mental illness. And so finally, I sat down and I wrote this column, and I wrote about my pure O, and it was the best thing I ever did. Because when it came out, I got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of um, letters, emails, cards. I even got a jar of marmalade, homemade marmalade from a reader. Telegraph readers are the best. Because um, obviously I'm a bit like Paddington Bear. But all of, these, all, all, of these, all of these letters, all of these emails, as well as saying, as, my, you know, as a journalist, you get a lot of abuse, right? You get a lot of, you know, why are you so fat? Why are you so awful? Why are you a woman? That kind of thing. And, and, and it was really shocking to me that of all the things, I, this jumper is really itchy and horrible. I wish I could take it off, but I've only got a bra underneath on. Um, so you, 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 um, you, you get a lot of abuse. And it was the first time I'd written something where everything I received was overwhelmingly positive. And it was people um, not just saying, I wish you well, but also saying, me too, in, if not OCD, then some other form of mental illness. Um, and, and I realized then, as I was reading all these, it, doesn't, it obviously doesn't give you any pleasure to know other people have experienced the horrors that you have, but it does give you some sort of comfort to know you're not alone, you're not a freak. Um, and what I realized reading all of these um, uh, letters was that what all mental illnesses have in common is that they lie to you. Like if they were a politi oh, fuck it. if they were a <laughs> if they were a politician, they'd uh, they'd be Donald Trump. So if you have a mental illness and you're looking for a name for it, and Jareth the Goblin King doesn't work, try Donald Trump. Um, they lie to you. They tell you you're worthless. They tell you that no one understands what you're going through and that you're a freak and no one ever will. And that's bullshit. And I realised when I was sorry, I have some oh, I'm gonna have to pick it up. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, uh, I realized that actually it's really, 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 really normal to feel weird, right? And actually it's probably more unusual if you've gone through life and never ever felt depressed or anxious or any of those other things. Um, and I thought, how do I replicate this feeling that I've got, this feeling of comfort and, and, and realizing that I, what I have is just an illness. Um, and obviously I did that by writing a book. Um, it's not a self-help book, uh, because clearly I can't help myself in any way, I'm not an expert. But I tell, I tell my story in the hope that um, it will give someone else the courage to tell the, their story, because um, it's, you know, sometimes we're not all fine. And in Britain we have this sort of stiff up a lip, keep buggering on mentality, and it's bollocks, it's literally kill people. If you are a man under 45 in the UK, the thing most likely to kill you is not a gun, it's not your heart, it's not a car, it's yourself. 
And let me tell you, the statistics are not that great for women either. And one in four of us this year will experience a mental illness, which means that four in four of us know someone that will. Probably in this room right now, there are scores of people experiencing mental illness. And for that, I am really sorry. But what I will say is that the next time someone asks you how you are, or you ask how are you to someone that you think perhaps isn't right, be honest, be honest, give an honest answer, because you are not alone and you don't need to suffer in silence.